Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. You must have those goals. You cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. Welcome to Goals by Zig Ziglar. You have important goals to achieve. Maybe there's a personal goal concerning your present relationships. You might have a financial goal to reach or a professional goal concerning the next jump in your career. You also know that setting and reaching those goals requires specific action steps and a concrete plan. So why don't more people set goals? So many millions of people have been conditioned to believe that there is no use in setting goals because over a period of time, nothing good is going to happen to them anyhow. They've been told a lot of times that you cannot do things, don't expect it. The input basically has been negative. You're about to receive plenty of positive input. Real world success stories that show conclusively goals do work. But we won't stop there. You'll hear step-by-step -step instructions that will show you exactly how to set and get whatever goal you desire. Somebody once said that failure is the line of least persistence. Success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. I believe that is true. Get prepared to start receiving the rewards, the dreams, and the desires you've always wanted. Goals do work. And with Zig Ziglar as your teacher, you can't help but achieve every goal you set. Thank you. Thank you. About eight or nine years ago, there was a new cafeteria that opened here in Dallas. And I like to eat in cafeterias because I can choose exactly what I want and I can see what I'm about to eat. So I was excited about this one because it was a new chain of cafeterias and give us a new uh, source of eating. Well, the redhead and I rode past it. Now, my wife, incidentally, I refer to her as the redhead. She's a decided redhead, meaning simply that one day she just decided uh, she is going to be a redhead. And when I talk about her, uh, I call her the redhead. When I'm talking to her, it's sugar baby. And her name is Jean. Well, the redhead and I were riding down, and every time we would pass the cafeteria, the line was sticking out the door. Finally, the beautiful day came, no line out the door, we go walking in. When we walked in, we could understand why the line was not out the door, because they had snaked it all over the place. We were already parked, so we decided to stay. She and I visited as we walked down the line, had about 30 people in it. We got to the end of that line and turned around, and there was another line of about 30 people. So we were walking and talking as we walked down, turned around, there's another line of about 30 people. But this time I could see what was going to be available. I could see between the people being served. And I made mental notes as I walked down the line, said, I believe I'll have me some of that. Yeah, and that looks good. Boy, I want me some of that. Boy, and I like the looks of that. I'll take me some of that. Now, it's important that you make these decisions because I don't care how prodigious your appetite is. You cannot eat some of everything on a big cafeteria line. So I had to make those choices. Finally, I got my tray and my silver, and I came down the line, and my choice has already been made, so I wasted no time. I said, I'll take me some of that, and give me some of that, and I want some of that, and I'll have some of that. Got to the end of the line, I reached in my uh, pocket and pulled out my money. The lady held up her hand, and she said, no, you don't pay for it until you get ready to go. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to let me eat all of this food and not have to pay for it until I get ready to go? She said, yeah, that's just the way we do it. Well, I can't tell you the number of times I've thought about that because, you see, in one sense of the word, that is exactly like life, the cafeteria line is. In life, we have an incredible assortment of choices of the places we can live, the things we can do, the foods we can eat, the occupations we can follow. An incredible number of choices. That's the way the cafeteria line is. Life is just like that. But on the other end of the scale, life is 180 degrees apart from the cafeteria line. In the cafeteria, you eat and then you pay. But in the game of life, you pay and then you eat. 
You go to school, you study your lessons, you pass the grade, they move you up to the next grade until you graduate from high school. Then if you go to college, then you study your lessons again, you get your degree. Then if you go on to graduate school, and finally after all of that is over, you get into your profession and you work a week, a month, or whatever, and then and only then after you've done all of those things, qualified and then done the work, do you receive the pay. The farmer plows the ground, he plants the seed, he waters it, he fertilizes it, he nurses it along, he kills the insects, and finally the day comes when he can go to the fields and bring it in and take it to the marketplace, and then he cashes it in. That's the way it is. You first pay, and then you receive the benefits. As we look at this segment of personal growth, we're going to be talking about the fact that we've all got to have goals in life. Most of us, you see, are very much like this old boy down home. His wife sent him downtown to buy ham. He came home and she said, Honey, you didn't cut the end of it off. He said, You didn't tell me to. She said, Well, I thought you knew. We always cut the end of the ham off. And he said, Why? She said, Well, Mother always cuts the end of the ham off. He said, Well, Mama's back in the kitchen. Let's go back there and ask her. So they went to the kitchen and said, Mama, how come you cut the end of the ham off? She said, I always cut the end of the ham off because my mama cuts the end of the ham off. So the old boy said, well, let's solve this three-generation mystery right now. They got on the phone long distance. They called Grandma, and they said, Grandma, how come you cut the end of the ham off? She said, I cut the end of the ham off because my roaster is too small. <laughs> <laughs> now, Grandma had a reason for cutting the end of the ham off. But the question is, do you have a reason? The reality is that 97% of the people in our society do not have clearly defined, written down goals for their lives. Now, there are four basic reasons they don't have goals. And the first reason, actually, is because of fear. Spelled, of course, F-E-A-R. And this forms an acrostic for false evidence appearing real. So many millions of people have been conditioned to believe that there is no use in setting goals because over a period of time, nothing good is going to happen to them anyhow. They've been told a lot of times that you cannot do things, don't expect it. The input basically has been negative. Chad Helmstetter, in his book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, points out that the average 18-year-old has been told 148,000 times, no, or you can't do it. 77% of our self-talk is negative. Dr. J. Allen Peterson, in his book, The Myth of the Green of Grass, points out that one computer study revealed that over 90% of the daily input in our minds is of a negative nature. And so a lot of people, therefore, simply do not set those goals. They've accumulated some false evidence, but it appears real, and they act accordingly. Because if it appears real as a practical matter, it has the same impact as if it were real. For example, I could go into any city, just about anywhere in the world, with nothing but my handkerchief that I have in my hand, and I could rob a bank with my handkerchief in my finger. All I'd have to do is put the handkerchief across my face, put my finger in my coat pocket, aim at the teller, and say, give me your money. The evidence would be false. It would appear real. And that individual would handle it as if there were a real gun in there. Now, I'd walk out with the money. I might get shot on the way out, but at least that teller would surrender that money. You might have seen this, a young Cuban hijacked a plane to Cuba using nothing but a bar of soap. He put the bar of soap in a box. He said to the captain of the aircraft, this is a bomb, let's go to Cuba. They went to Cuba. The evidence was false. It appeared real. The thing about life, the thing about nature is this. Oliver Wendell Holmes years ago said, the great tragedy in America today is not the waste of our natural resources, though that is a great tragedy. He said the real tragedy is the waste of our human resources. And the average individual will go to their grave with their music still in them. You see, man and nature are 180 degrees apart. We use up nature's natural resources by using them up. We use up man's natural resources by not using them at all. 
Fear keeps a lot of people from setting goals. The second thing that keeps a lot of people from setting goals is because they have such a poor self-image. They cannot imagine in their wildest imagination them becoming college graduates, getting the superb job, living in the nice home, winning the ideal mate. They cannot imagine themselves being financially successful or secure. Their image simply will not let them get there. Now understand again that we perform in accordance with the image or the picture we have planted in our own mind. Positive thinking will not work for the individual who is negative on himself. You got to have that positive image, that good self-image of yourself. One of the most amazing stories, which I believe really epitomizes what I want to say about this, is the story of Tom Hartman. On January the 28th, 1979, Tom Hartman attended a seminar up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It was an all-day seminar. Later, I got a letter from him. Since then, he and I have become friends. We've corresponded a number of times, visited a number of times. And the gist of the story is this. He attended that seminar that day because his brother had an extra ticket. That was Tom's day off. There were about 15 or 1,600 other people there. Tom sat in the very center of the audience. In his first letter to me, he said, you know, Zig, as I sat there, I hadn't been there three minutes before I realized I was in the wrong place. You were in front of this audience saying some wild things, like you can go where you want to go, you can do what you want to do, you can be like you want to be. And I thought to myself, oh, brother, is that a bunch of baloney? I'd heard guys like you before. And to be honest, he said, it made me a little uncomfortable, and I looked around for a way for me to easily get out of there in case it got any worse, which is exactly <laughs> what it did. It wasn't three more minutes when you actually had the gall to look at that audience to all of us and say, God loves you, and he wants the best for you. And I knew that was a bunch of baloney, and I really looked around for a way to get out, but there I was, stuck right in the middle. 15 or 1,600 people, and there was no way I could get up without creating a disturbance. So he said, I looked at my watch, and I just decided I would get out of there at the first break, and that would be the end of that. A few minutes later, you even made some reference to the fact that we were going to be dead longer than we were going to be alive, and therefore we needed to be setting those really long-range goals. Was it long when you had the audacity to say to us that man was designed for accomplishment? He's engineered for success. He's endowed with the seeds of greatness. Now, when you said that, Zig, you said, I looked down and I thought to myself, well, is it at least partially right? Because I was looking at a 63 and one half inch waistline and 407 pounds of bulk. He said, I was coming off a devastating divorce. I had a job only because my employer was my friend, not because I was actually earning the money. Hadn't been to church in many years. I was so broke that every Friday night I was writing a hot check so I could get something to eat and I would pick it up on Monday morning. This was, I said, was about 10 years ago. And he said, there you were saying all of those things. And I don't really know, Zig, what it was that you said. But somehow or other, something rang a bell in my mind. And I don't know whether it was because of the repetition or because somebody behind me said, that's right, or reinforced you in some way. But I reached over and I got my pen and I started to take notes on my yellow pad. I said, Zig, I took notes all day long. When I got through for the first time in my adult lifetime, I saw just a glimmer of hope. I so desperately wanted to get your set of tapes on motivation, but I did not have a dime to my name. And my brother, bless his heart, he loaned me the money. I went home that day and I listened to those tapes. That evening, seven hours. I'd listened to you live seven hours. Now I listened to you seven hours on tape. The next morning, I came in and the first thing I did was tell my boss that he no longer just had a friend on the payroll, that he now had an employee. Old Tom kind of grins and he said, I even told him I was going to start carrying my own weight. Now he said, Zig, you know, at 407 pounds, that represented a pretty substantial statement. 
He went over to Oklahoma City University that afternoon and enrolled in a couple of courses in psychology. He was already taking a couple of courses in history and he decided to switch over so he could learn something about himself and something about his fellow man. The next day he went down to the Nautilus Health Studio. He decided to do something about his miserable physical condition. Then on Thursday he went down to one of the men's stores and laid aside about $700 worth of clothes with a minute down payment. When the owner of the store saw him buying size 47 coats and 39 slacks, he went to him and he said, Mr. Hartman, who are you buying the clothes for? Tom told me, he said, when I told him I was buying them for myself, he looked at me like he thought I was crazy. But I said to him, don't worry about it, I will wear these clothes out of here. Tom Hartman said, you know, Zig, somebody might resist you once or twice or a dozen times, but when you keep telling them that you are important, that you are somebody, that you do have ability, that you can do things with your life, he said, I just believe eventually that it will get through. And he kind of grins and he says, you know, isn't it amazing? A message can go around the world 24,000 miles in less than a tenth of a second. And then sometimes it takes years for it to go that last one-eighth of an inch. But he said, finally, the message got through to me. I was listening every day. And as a matter of fact, Zig, he said, I've listened to your tape so much that if you ever get a sore throat, don't you dare cancel the engagement. You just call me because he said, I can deliver it verbatim. <laughs> he said, I've even got the same accent, if you can imagine him accusing me of having an accent. Well, he said, you know, Zig, I had been on the program about six weeks. Never forget it. I was in a store getting my food. And there was a little four-year-old girl in there with her mother. And those of you who are ever four years old, or if you have four-year-olds, you know there's one thing about a four-year-old, when a thought pops in the mind, it pops out of the mouth uncensored. I mean, you get truth, pure truth, out of the mouth of a four-year-old. Well, in a voice that you could hear halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth, this little four-year-old screamed out, Mama, look at that fat man. And Tom said, I turned around <laughs> to see where he was. <laughs> and he said, then it dawned on me, she was talking about me. And he said, I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. He said, I laughed until I literally cried. And then he said, I shed a different kind of a tear. Because he said, for the first time in my adult lifetime, I really knew and knew that I knew that I was going to make it. He said, that was reinforced about a month later. I'd been to the movie. I was on the way back to my car. I was in no hurry. I had nowhere to go, nothing to do when I got there. And we've all done this as we amble down the street with no direction in mind, no hurry involved. He saw a display in a window. And though he was not really interested in the display, he ambled over and he started looking at it. And Tom said, you know, Zig, I don't know whether I was there for one minute or ten minutes. But he said, all of a sudden, I became aware of the fact that I was not by myself. Some big dude was looking over my shoulder and he said, I whirled around. And of course, there was no one there because Tom Hartman had been looking at his own image, which he no longer recognized. Good friend of mine before his tragic death, John Kozak from Dunedin, Florida, brilliant young psychiatrist, said that at that specific moment, Tom Hartman was no longer obese. Though he still weighed over 360 pounds, he was no longer obese because he no longer saw himself as an obese person. The basic problem with crash diets, according to Dr. Kozak, is that they will take the weight off your body. That's relatively easy. But then that individual lays down at night in the dream, and they dream as an overweight person. And the body goes to work to complete the picture the mind has given it. Tom Hartman no longer saw himself as an overweight person. Now, what's the end of the story? Well, of course, the story hasn't ended yet. But Tom Hartman graduated magna cum laude with his degree in psychology. He's working on his doctorate. Tom weighs a little over 200 pounds, which is about what he should weigh. He's about six feet three inches tall and has a very large frame. 
He teaches a Sunday school class every Sunday. He's in business for himself. And I give you the story in such great detail because I believe that when you analyze it, here was a man who was physically bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. He was socially bankrupt. From a family perspective, he was bankrupt. He was bankrupt in every important area of life. And yet, because he became involved in the development of a good self-image, he got involved in setting those goals, and the results were absolutely spectacular. you got to have goals. The third reason that 97% of the people don't have goals is basically they have never really been sold. Now, that's my prime function in this particular segment, is to sell you on having your goals. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. By the time this recording is over, you will, in fact, be sold on the absolute necessity of having goals. I am so confident that you're going to be sold that I'm going to tell you that before you go to bed tonight, you will have started taking the important steps to setting your own goals. I'll even go further than that. If you don't write some of your goals down this very evening, you might as well not go to bed as far as sleep is concerned because you are not going to be able to go to sleep. Let me say that again. <laughs> if you don't write them down, you're not even going to be able to go to sleep. You absolutely must have goals. Now, I want to stress, goals work for individuals, they work for families, they work for companies, and they work for nations as well. The basic problem that we face is this. Most people, when they're busy working on the job, they get to thinking, you know, I really ought to be spending more time with my family. And then when they're spending time with their family, they get to thinking, you know, I really ought to be out there working for my family. And when they're out there working with their family or for their family, their mind is back home. And when they're back home, their mind is back out there in the field. <laughs> then they tell everybody, well, I don't ever have time for anything. No wonder you're always traveling. <laughs> you see, the truth is, most people, when they're at work, their mind is at play. When they're at play, their mind is at work. So they're neither working nor playing wherever they are that is wasting time any way you look at it. Now, one of the beautiful things about having goals and directions is the fact that you will be able to work when you work and play when you play. I will not suggest that you work harder. As a matter of fact, by the time we get through, you will probably end up working less. But when you're on the job, you will be on the job. You will be working infinitely more effectively when you work in this manner. And you will have that balance of life. We say it so many times in so many different ways. There's a difference between standard of living and quality of life. And we're going to be looking at quality of life because that's the significant thing. 1953, Yale University did a study of their graduating seniors. They discovered that of those seniors, only 3% of them had taken all of the steps necessary to set their goals. That is, they had identified exactly what they wanted and written it down. They had spelled out why they wanted to reach these goals. They had listed the obstacles they had to overcome in order to get there. They had identified the people, the groups, and the organizations they needed to work with in order to get there. They had identified what they needed to know to reach that goal. They had developed a plan of action to reach that goal. And finally, they were able to put the date on it as to when they expected to get there. Only 3% of the graduating seniors had taken all of those steps. An additional 10% had taken five of those steps, but 87% of them, beyond identifying that they wanted to be a doctor or a professor or an attorney or whatever, really had not done that much towards goal setting. Now, please understand, everybody has goals. One of your goals, for example, if you're in your car listening to this recording, one of your goals was to listen to this recording. Everybody has goals. But we want to get a little more involved in that. We really want to get involved so that we know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we can get much better results. 1973, they did another study on those seniors who had graduated from Yale. And in the two areas which they could measure, 
that is their financial accomplishments and their career accomplishments, the 3% who had taken all of the seven steps had accomplished more than the 97% who had not. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. You must have those goals. You cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. A lot of people go to work tomorrow because that's what they did yesterday. And if that's the reason you're going to go tomorrow, you won't be as good as you were yesterday because now you're two days older and you're no closer to the goal, which you do not have. A lot of people complain about lack of time. It is not lack of time in 99% of the cases. It is lack of direction. Direction literally creates time and motivation creates energy. Let me see the hands of those in here who have ever had one of those days. Can I see your hands? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. Uh, you get up early in the morning. You've got that a critically important appointment at 8.30. And so you get up two hours early. You want to make absolutely certain you get there on time. And you walk out the front door. You're all spiffed up and spanked up. I mean, you're really raring and ready to go. You got a full hour to get there. But as you walk out, you notice that you've got a flat tire. That's the best thing that happens to you all day long. I mean, that is just the beginning point of it right there. You hustle and bustle and sweat and you get the tire changed and you got to change your clothes, you clean up, and you rush down to the appointment. You get there on exactly the specified time and you see a little note on the door. Sorry, I was called out of town. Uh, have thought the matter over. Have decided I'm not interested. Don't you call me. I will call you. <laughs> you go down to the office and you're greeted with a ringing telephone as you walk in. It is your administrative assistant and she cannot make it for that day. You notice that it appears to be unusually hot and that's because the air conditioner has cut off. A couple of hours later, the plumbing breaks down and one thing after another all day long until finally mercifully the day ends and you're not whipped you are whooped I mean you have had it you wearily get your coat you struggle out to the car and you drive home with scarcely enough energy to walk in the front door your wife of course lovingly greets you there at the front door and she said honey I'm so glad that you didn't have to work late because today is the day Today is the day for what? Oh, honey, don't tell me you forgot it. You know, we planned on this for the last three weeks. We planned on what? Today is the day, honey. Don't you remember today is the day we cleaned the garage? <laughs> oh, honey, not today. I couldn't put one foot in front of another, honey. I just don't have any. Oh, honey, it's not going to take that long. I'm going to help you. It won't take more than two, three, four, five hours. Absolute maximum. Oh, honey, I just can't not today. I just ain't up to it. I don't have any energy. And the telephone rings. <laughs> Voice at the end says, hey, partner, I've got us a tea time over at the country club in 17 minutes. We've got time to get in nine if you feel like playing. If I feel like playing, man, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> and everybody here agrees with exactly what I'm saying, don't you? The answer is yes, isn't it? <clears throat> okay. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We've got plenty of energy to do the things we really want to do. But as I often say, life is not easy. Life is tough. But when you're tough on yourself, life is going to be infinitely easier on you. And I'm going to tell you that when you do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, the day will come when you can do the things you want to do, when you want to do them. A lot of people say, well, I just don't feel motivated to do something. Well, you got it backwards. You do the something and then you will feel motivated to do it. Motivation literally follows the action. Motivation creates energy. When you talk about goals, 
I love the story of Jean-Henri Fabre, the great French naturalist. He conducted a series of experiments with some processionary caterpillars, so named because they follow each other in a procession. He lined them around a flower pot until they formed a never-ending circle. He put some pine needles in the center of the flower pot, that is the food, of the processionary caterpillar. They started going round and round and round, 24 hours a day, 48 hours in a two day, 72 hours, and then they kept going on and on for seven full days and seven full nights. They went round and round and round until they literally dropped dead from starvation and exhaustion. With an abundance of their favorite food less than six inches away, they had starved to death because they confused activity with accomplishment. A lot of people do exactly the same thing. You don't know where you live, but I can tell you something about your town. And I can tell you about somebody who's in the same business that you are. Some of them are doing exceptionally well, and some of them are not doing good at all. And I don't care what that business is. It's not the location. It is not our abilities. But basically, it is because of our thinking and our direction that definitely is going to make the difference. There are so many people, you see, who never really get those directions in life. You've seen them in every company. They will come in and you watch them all day long. They're almost hyper. They're here and they're there and they're everywhere else. I mean, they're busy, busy, busy. But at the end of the day, you will still see a full desk and no evidence that they've accomplished anything because they really don't have direction. The most outstanding example of goal setting that I have ever heard of has to do with the Japanese. In 1950, a war-torn, devastated Japan, a nation which had lost a higher percentage of its young men to war than any nation in the last 100 years, cities had been bombed out, they have no real natural resources. They have no iron ore. They have no coal. They have no oil. But in 1950, the leaders of government and business and industry got together. And they said, let's set a goal. Let's become the number one nation in the world in the production of textiles during the 1950s. And they made it. In 1960, they set the impossible goal. And that was to become the number one nation in the world in the production of steel. Now, in order to do that, they've got to build the steel mills. They've got to import the iron ore from thousands of miles away. They've got to import the coal and the oil from thousands of miles away. They've got to manufacture the steel. Then they've got to ship it thousands of miles to its market and undersell its competition. Impossible. But the Japanese, in this case, did not look at what they did not have. They looked at what they did have, a willingness to work. And they worked hard. They reached their goal. In 1970, they set another goal. They said, during this decade, let's become the number one nation in the world in the production of automobiles. They missed it by one year. It took them until 1980 when their plant became the largest and number one producer of automobiles in the world. In 1980, they set another goal. They said, during this decade, let's become number one in the production of electronics and computers. And all you've got to do is go to video land, and all you've got to do is look at the computer world today, and you can see exactly what they are doing. Because goals do work, whether it's for the individual, the family, or the company, or the nation, I'm absolutely convinced that we have a real threat, unless we have our goals more firmly in place, and that is to remain strong so we will remain free. Goals absolutely work. I love the story of Sir Edmund Hillary. You might have heard it. Sir Edmund Hillary, you know, was the first man to scale Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the whole world. Can you imagine him climbing down off that mountain? And one a reporter comes up to him and said, Tell me, Sir Edmund, how did you climb the tallest mountain in the whole world? How did you do it? Do you think for one moment he said, Well, I, 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 I was just out walking around. <laughs> Can you imagine the chairman of the board, General Motors? Somebody comes to him and said, how'd you get to be the chairman of the board for General Motors? And he said, well, I, I just showed up for work and they started promoting me and here I am, the chairman of the board for General Motors. Can you imagine 
The coach of an NFL football team, Landry, for example, calling the Cowboys together one Saturday afternoon and saying, fellas, now, you know we're going to play them Washington Redskins tomorrow. That's a pretty tough bunch. We better think of something to do. You see, that's absurd. It's ridiculous. They will spend hours and hours and hours planning a football game. And yet we don't plan the most important events in our life. Too many Americans spend more time planning the wedding than they spend planning the marriage. Too many people spend more time planning on how to get the job than they spend on how to becoming productive and successful in that job. You got to have goals. J.C. Penney expressed it this way. Give me a stunt clerk with a goal and I'll give you someone who will make history. But he said, you give me someone without a goal, and I will give you a stock clerk. You gotta have goals, that's for sure. I don't know if the name Howard Hill rings a bell with you or not. Howard Hill was a good Alabama boy, and he was an archer. He entered 286 archery tournaments. He placed first. 286 times. He killed a Cape Buffalo, the toughest game animal alive to bring down. He killed it with a bow and arrow. He killed a Bengal tiger with a bow and arrow. He killed a lot of game animals with a bow and arrow. As a youngster, I have seen newsreels of Howard Hill from a distance of 50 feet where he would literally split the bullseye dead center and then he would take the next arrow and split that dead center. An incredible demonstration of skill. He killed an 18-foot shark under 15 feet of water. Or was it a 15-foot shark under 18 feet of water? <laughs> I know it was a great big one in his way down there. I do know that. <laughs> Howard Hill was an incredible marksman. Now, I have never shot the bow and arrow professionally, but I am an instructor par excellence. That means I'm good. That means I'm real good. As a matter of fact, I am so good as an instructor that I could take anyone in this live audience this evening or anyone who will ever hear this recording, and if your eyesight is good and your health is good, I could spend 20 minutes with any one of you, and at the end of the 20 minutes, I would have you hitting the bullseye more consistently than Howard Hill could have hit it the best day he ever had. Provided, of course, we had first blindfolded Howard Hill. <laughs> and turn him around a couple of times so he'd have no idea which direction he was facing. And you kind of snicker to yourself, especially those I imagine who are listening to this recording, as you say to yourself, well, Ezekiel, that's uh, true, of course, but it sure is a silly example. Why, how on earth could anybody possibly hit a target they couldn't even see? That's a pretty good question. Here's one even better. How can you hit a target you don't even have? Have you got your targets? Have you written them down? Have you spelled out the details of why you want to reach those goals in the first place? Have you identified the obstacles you have to overcome in order to get there? See, something stands between what you've got and what you want. If there was nothing between you and your goals, then you'd already be there. You gotta find out what those obstacles are. Have you spelled out what you need to know to reach your goals? Have you identified the people, the groups, and the organizations you need to work with in order to get there? Have you devised a specific plan of action in order to get there? And finally, have you put the date on it? Now the fourth reason that most people don't have goals basically is because they don't know how. Now, I'm going to give you some bad news and some good news. And as you know, you're going to get the bad news first. I mean, I'm not going to give you a choice. You get the bad news first. The bad news is this. If you really get involved in this goal setting process, it will take you somewhere between 10 and 20 hours to really set your goals. If you really have a complex set of goals, it might take you 30 hours to set your goals. That's another reason so many people never do really set them because that is a tremendous time investment. Now that's the bad news. The two bits of good news that go with it. 
on the absolute authority of several years of personal experience and the experience of many, many people who've been doing this, I can assure you that once you have set those goals properly, you will have created for yourself an additional three to as many as 10 hours every week of your life for the rest of your life. Let me say it again. When you discipline yourself to do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, the day will come when you can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. The good news is this will give you an awful lot of time to pursue the things which you have a real interest. It will give you control of your time and your activities and your future. The rest of the good news is this. When you learn how to set one goal, you'll know how to set all goals. When you learn how to set a physical goal, you'll also know how to set a mental, a spiritual, a social, a family, a career, and a financial goal. Because there's a procedure. There's a formula for setting all of them. If you can figure out the answer to what 12 times 12 is, you can also figure out what the answer to 2,865 times 9,412 is. If you know the formula, you can come up with the answer. Now to get you started on goals, let me share a little story with you, which I believe is significant. You see, I think as I tell this story and use this example, I think everybody ought to write a book. I don't necessarily believe you ought to get the book published or make any effort to get it published, but you ought to write a book. And I'll tell you what the title ought to be. What I think you ought to do to get the most out of life. Let me make a strong statement. If my book, See You at the Top, which has now sold two million copies counting foreign editions, if this book had never sold a single copy, I would still say this is the most profitable thing that I have ever done if it had never sold a single copy. Now, I'm not only talking about standard of living, but I'm also talking about quality of life when I make that statement. You see, this book really ought to be entitled What I Think You Ought to Do to Get the Most Out of Life. As I was writing this book, I realized what I was doing was I was clarifying my thinking about what life was all about. For the first time, I really discovered what I believed, what I felt was important, and the research uncovered a number of things that I already believed but I'd never been able to articulate. The title of your book ought to be What I Think You Ought to Do to Get the Most Out of Life. I want to share information about this because I believe this is a classic example about what goal setting and goal reaching is all about. When I started writing this, the first words I wrote were, you can go where you want to go, you can do what you want to do, you can be like you want to be. Well, as I looked at those words, I kind of got to talking to myself, which incidentally, I hasten to add, is perfectly all right. I was on a program with Dr. Joyce Brothers, and she said, scientifically speaking, they have proved that people who talk to themselves are above average in intelligence. <laughs> so if you've been talking to yourself, just be about it. It's perfectly all right. I'd like to express a personal opinion. That's all it is, personal opinion. I believe it's all right to answer. <laughs> but if you ever catch yourself saying, huh? <laughs> you got a problem. I caught myself saying, huh, uh, because I noticed I was holding the words I'd written way out there because there was a 41-inch waistline between me and the book and well over 200 pounds of Ziegler. And the thought occurred to me that one of these days I'd be bumping into one of you slender guys or gals and I could visualize you coming up to me and saying, Ziggler, you believe all that stuff you write? And I was going to say, of course I do. Then I could visualize you saying, do you believe it all? And I was going to say, well, of course I do. Then I could imagine you poking your finger in that 41-inch waistline and saying, Ziggler, do you believe it all? Then I was going to say, well, you know, us authors, we do take a little literary license every once in a while. <laughs> Ziggler, is that your fancy way of saying you lied about it? Now, holy phone, friend, don't call me a liar. People don't like liars. Well, you're at least a hypocrite then, man. Don't call me a hypocrite. People sure don't like hypocrites. I know you know that a hypocrite is a person who simply is not himself on Sunday. 
As a matter of fact, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people say, well, the only reason I don't go to church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites down there. Of course, I always tell him, friend, don't let that stop you. Come on down. We got room for one more. <laughs> Like I've had people say, well, I'd read the Bible, but I don't understand it. Of course, I don't think it's the part they don't understand that bothers them. <laughs> Actually, the Bible is pretty clear. I bet you noticed it didn't call them the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> well, anyhow, I had to make a decision. I had to decide either to take those words out of the book or I had to do something about me. Well, my boy was eight years old and I've always felt that a father ought to be able to spank his children until they get to be at least 12. The rate we were going, I wasn't even going to be able to catch mine, much less spank him. So I knew something had to be done. But as strongly as Brody Cam was back, the redhead kept telling me to hold my stomach in and I already was. So I knew I had to do something. Went down to see Dr. Cooper at Cooper Clinic of aerobics fame. You know, he wrote the books. They've sold over 15 million copies in a jumpteen number of foreign languages. I went down for the examination. First thing they did was took two quarts of my blood. <laughs> well, it looked like two quarts. They filled so many vials, I thought they were opening a branch of the blood bank right then and there. Then they dunked me in a tank of water three times. The purpose of that was to determine the percentage of body fat I had. When I got through, they told me I was 23 and 9 tenths percent pure lard. <laughs> then they put me on the treadmill. And on the treadmill, you know, you walk and you walk and you walk and you walk. And the longer you can walk, the better your physical condition. The worst possible condition was horrible. I decided, I just made up my mind, I'm going to stay on it until I at least get into just awful. And I made it by four seconds. <laughs> when they finished the examination, uh, Dr. Martin, the examining physician, called me in and he said, Mr. Ziegler, you'll be delighted to know that we've run all of these figures through the computer. And you, sir, are actually not overweight. I said, well, that's fantastic. However, he said, uh, according to the computer, you're exactly five and one half inches too short. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, Doc, that's pretty bad, isn't it? He said, no. He said, actually, you're in remarkably good shape for a 66-year-old. I said, Doc, I'm 46. He, he said, you're in awful shape. He said, as a matter of fact, if you were a building, I'd condemn you. And I said, well, Doc, what can I do? And he whipped out a sheet of paper thicker in my book to start telling me what I could do. And I tell you, he told me lots more than I wanted to know. I got home, and redhead said, well, I suppose you're going to be out running all over the neighborhood. And I said, yes, I am. Well, they said, if I'm going to have a 46-year-old fat boy running all over the place, I got to get you looking as good as I can. So she went down to the store and bought me some fancy running shirts and shorts, and I'd already gotten the shoes the doctor had recommended. Oh, and I did something else, and it was very ugly. But I had not read Ann Landers at the time, and I'm going to use that as my excuse. You know, Ann Landers said you should not steal pages out of other folks' magazines. There was a magazine at Dr. Cooper's office. Now, it was an old magazine. <laughs> it had an advertisement in there for jockey shorts. And I don't know if you folks read the jockey short ads or not, but if you don't read them, the next time you see one, you should at least look at the picture. You'll find out in a hurry, they don't put jockey shorts on fat boys. <laughs> at least they don't have a good year. <laughs> and so I took that picture out and I pasted it on my bathroom mirror and I said, now there's my hero. That's the way I'm going to look right there. Well, the next morning, the opportunity clock sounded off bright and early. Negative people, you know, call them alarm clocks. I rolled out of bed. I put on my fancy running outfit, hit the front door, and I ran a block. <laughs> Did better the next day, though. I ran a block and a mailbox. <laughs> And the next day I ran a block in two mailboxes, and a block in three, and a block in four. One day I ran all the way around the block, came back in, woke the whole family up and said, guess what dad has done? <laughs> then one day I ran a half a mile, then a mile, then a mile and a half, then two, then three, then four, then five. The waist started coming down from 202 to 165. The waistline fell to 34. A lot of times people have said, yeah, but I'll bet you were dieting religiously all that time. That is partially true because I did quit eating in church. <laughs> Tried a 30-day diet and lost a month. Incidentally, 
For those who want to lose weight, and I know it sounds like I'm trying to get everybody to go on a diet. That is not my purpose for this crowd this evening, though there are five of you who should. <laughs> Now there are about 65 of you who wonder who the other four are, but anyhow, <laughs> for those of you who want to know about weight loss, let me give you four fast little tips to lose weight. Number one, and probably the most important, stay away from cottage cheese. <laughs> now, a lot of people don't realize this, but cottage cheese is the most fattening food in existence. Now understand I have no scientific evidence of this or proof, but the evidence is so compelling I know I'm right. Because as I've traveled all over the world, I've noticed it is internationally true that don't nothing but fat folks eat the stuff. <laughs> so stay away from cottage cheese. Number two, get a thorough examination. This is on the serious side. Get a thorough examination from your skinny doctor. Now, if he's not slender, that means he doesn't believe in the importance of taking that care of his body, and he or she are not going to be very persuasive as far as their dealing with you is concerned. Get a thorough physical from a doctor who believes in what he's doing. The third thing is this. If the doctor starts to give you a prescription, do not walk out on the doctor. Run out on the doctor. <laughs> you didn't gain the weight taking pills, and you're not going to permanently lose the weight by taking the pills. Now, I'm going to make a claim which I could not prove in 10,000 years, but I honestly believe it's the truth. I believe that more people have lost more weight and kept it off as a result of listening to these recordings and reading See You at the Top than have ever lost on 99 and 9 tenths percent of all of the diet books ever written. You see, diet really and weight is not really the problem. That simply is the manifestation of the problem. The fourth thing is if you get a negative doctor, swap him off for a positive doctor. Now, what's a negative doctor? Basically, it's a doctor that always tells you what you can't eat. You can't have this, leave that alone, doesn't touch that. Man, stay away from this. What they're really saying is now, if you like it, you can't have it. If you don't like it, eat all you want. That basically is what they boil down to. The thing I loved about Dr. Martin was the fact that he was so positive. I've never seen a more positive doctor. He is a slender young guy, runs in the Boston Marathon, does the good things. Dr. Martin said to me, Mr. Ziegler, you're going to be delighted to know that you can eat anything you want. He said, I have prepared a list of what you are going to want. <laughs> People often say to me, Ziegler, what can't you eat? I don't know what I can't eat. Why should I clutter up my mind with a bunch of stuff can't have anyhow? I can tell you that I can eat lots of chicken. I can eat lots of fish. I can eat fruits and vegetables and salads. I can eat, on occasion, good lean roast beef. I can eat just about anything that I want to eat. Now, I believe that a combination of diet and exercise to keep the weight off permanently is the key. In December, I injured my back, for example, and there was a two-month span that I could not jog, and I picked up eight pounds. See, my body retains ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> but when you put them together, the diet and the exercise, now we're on the right track. There are four reasons people don't have goals. One is because of fear. The second one is because of their self-image. The third one is they've never been sold, and the fourth one is they do not know how. A number of years ago, Mary Crowley made a statement. She said that one person with a commitment is worth more than a hundred who only have an interest. I'm convinced that people who make commitments to reach their goals are the ones who are going to reach them. A number of years ago, a young coach at the University of South Carolina was fired after his first season on his first job. Not only did the head coach say, no more for you here, but he advised him to get out of coaching. He said, let's face it, you just don't have it. But the young coach had set his goal. He had made a commitment. He had said, someday I'm going to coach at the University of Notre Dame. 
Ohio State gave him a chance, and he was an assistant there for a couple of years, and William and Mary called him, and he was their head coach, and then North Carolina State University called him, and for four years there, he had the best one-loss record they'd ever had. From there, he went into the pros and coached the New York Jets for a season, but he really missed coaching the young men and helping mold their character. And then University of Arkansas called him and had a phenomenally successful career there. He built the best one-loss record they had ever had. He went to the Orange Bowl, I believe it was in 1979. And before he went down to play the University of Oklahoma, the media had speculated that it would be a mismatch, that Oklahoma simply was too powerful. To compound the problem, three offensive players, as a matter of fact, the entire offense of that Arkansas team were caught with a woman in the room. They explored, investigated, discovered that it was absolutely true, and the coach immediately dismissed all three players. The media again speculated that what he should do is decline the invitation of the Orange Bowl, let somebody else accept the invitation who would be a worthy opponent for the Oklahoma team. But the coach was a committed man. He looked at what he did have left and didn't worry about what he did not have. They accentuated the positive, if you will. They developed a specific game plan. The rest is history. They won the game, I believe it was by about 31 to 6. He left the University of Arkansas and became the head coach at the University of Minnesota. Now, when he accepted the Minnesota assignment, he said to them, I will take the assignment provided you will give me one out. And that is that if the University of Notre Dame calls me to be their head coach, and if I take this team to a bowl within two years, there he is with those goals again. Well, two years later, the University of Minnesota was invited to play in a bowl, and the University of Notre Dame called Lou Holtz to be their head coach. Now, the interesting thing is this. They called him to be their head coach the day he dismissed those three players from his team when he was at the University of Arkansas several years earlier. Now, they made their decision then. They didn't put the call into him. But when that happened, they said, here is a man who is interested in building character and developing leaders. There's the man we want to be our coach the next time we have an opening as the head coach at Notre Dame University. I happen to know Lou quite well. We've been on seminars together. We've corresponded together. We've spent a little time together. He said that there never was any doubt in his mind about dismissing those players. It was the right thing to do. What I'm saying is this. When you've got a solid base with a solid commitment, and solid objectives, you've got a much better chance of reaching your goal. But it does take those commitments.